Matthew 25, starting with verse 14, it says, again, it will be like a man. Again, meaning that the kingdom of God, the time at hand, remember in Matthew 24, he's preaching about the end time events and also uh, around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, he's, he's ministering to both generations, those who were listening to him in that moment that would be around for the destruction of Jerusalem and those who would be the last day generation. And he's saying, again, it will be like what we just talked about in Matthew 24 and what was uh, said in the first parable it's at the beginning of Matthew 25. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity again to delve into your word, to know you better. We ask for your spirit to give us understanding. This can only happen if you grant us this prayer request. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. Wow. Sounds like a very generous master leaving that much money in the care of his three servants. And he did this based on their ability. In other words, you're not going to trust a million dollars with somebody who is not of age to handle a million dollars, right? You want to make sure that this person is fiscally responsible if you're going to give them that much of your wealth. But the master goes on a journey. He leaves his money to the care of three servants. And the first servant, the Bible tells us, doubles the money. The five bags of gold that he has, he doubles this money. Now, how do you double money like that? How do you make your money work for you like that? That's, that's what the Bible says. That's not, that's not me making it up. He says he put the money to work. How do you think he did that? Any, any people out here that uh, make their money work? What did he do? He invested. <clears throat> he invested. So uh, some of you don't know this because I know that in the, uh, the, uh, the election cycle and all the campaigning, um, you know, economy was a big topic, right? A big topic. Don't worry, we can talk about this. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're safe. We're all safe. <clears throat> so economy was a big topic. And, and, but what most people did not know that the inflation rate is at a good place right now, 2.3. We're, 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 we're actually under the average right now. The economy has rebounded, and the stock market has never been better in its history. Did you all know that? Anybody know that? Right. The problem is, the problem is it hasn't reached our pocketbooks. Uh, Chipotle is still too expensive. Taco Bell still is charging airport prices, Right. So it's difficult for us to believe the economy is better because it hasn't yet reached our pocketbook. That's why it was a big topic uh, with the candidates campaigning that, you know, you didn't know what to do with, with the economy. Well, you didn't know what to do with the economy and so on and so forth. But it has rebounded coming out of the pandemic. Like most nations, we were all struggling, but it's starting to get better. But where you really see the economy doing well is in the markets. Anybody know about enough about the markets? Anyone invest, right? Fidelity, right? Anybody there? Charles Schwab. If you, if you are investing, some of you have seen it in your 401k, you have seen the benefits of a market that has rebounded and is healthy. So the only way that you can make that type of gain if you have your money working for you in the market. Now, Elder Aaron Stone, if you double your money in a matter of months, how aggressive do you have to be in your investments? A lot. Really aggressive. If you put your money, you put $100,000 in the market, and in and, and several months' time, you double it to $200,000, you're being a little bit aggressive, right? Now, some might call that reckless. 
But the first servant takes $5 million and doubles it to $10 million. Now, you know, being that aggressive, you could also lose $5 million. Is it worth it? I'm not that aggressive. No, I'm just like, I'm going to put it in the stuff that I know that works. Apple. Taco Bell. That's only because I'm hungry I'm saying that. Taco Bell. Right? I, I, I'm not that aggressive. Now, the, the second servant comes around, and he has $2 million, and he also doubles it. Is he also being aggressive? Where's our economists out there? Our financial advisors. Is he also being aggressive? Yes. Now, watch this. Isn't it easier to be aggressive with money that's not your own? Because I know I was aggressive growing up with my mom's money. <laughs> Toys are us. Mom, pour into the market. Invest into the market. Invest in He-Man and Skeletor and watch your returns. You're going to have good kids, smiling kids, happy kids. Right? So, so it's easy to be aggressive with money that is not your own. So they're being very aggressive with the money. And then we get to the third servant, the Bible says, who's not very aggressive. In fact, he's not aggressive at all. Some would say he's really safe, maybe too safe. All he does is bury the money. The Bible says, as we continue on, verse 19, that after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done. Well done. Just curious here. Would he have said well done had he lost the five million? Just a question. Just a question. Well done. He says, and good, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man, verse 24 and 25, then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he says, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Let's underline that. Let's underline that. I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground, See, here is what belongs to you. In other words, I didn't lose a penny. How did the master respond? He says to him, verse 26, verse 27, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received what? It back with interest. Now, some of you, that's how you choose to invest. You just put it in a CD or long-term savings and hope to get maybe 1% back and so on and so forth. You're, you're, you're safe. You're cautious. You're not willing to risk but people who don't have a lot of money can't take as many risks, amen? <laughs> amen, pastors? <laughs> you can't, you, you don't have the, the luxury of being that risky with your money when you don't have a lot because if you only have $40 for that week and you invest all $40 and lose that $40, well, you ain't eating. Now, I know... Uh, Earl, you said we have to trust in God's promises, so we can't, but sometimes you got to be just smart, amen? Not, not test the Lord. <laughs> be smart with your money. 
So it, it, it's, 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 not, it's, it, it's not responsible when you don't have a lot and it's the only money that your family has to risk that much. And this man has little and he's trusted with little because of his ability, meaning that up until this point, the master knows he's not the most responsible person. So I just want to unpack this a little bit because first and foremost, I feel like that the master of these three servants is rewarding aggressive, reckless behavior. Can we just see that right now in this parable? People just walking around with millions of dollars. I mean, this is what angers the little people, you know, the, the middle class folk. This is why sometimes we decide which side we're on, red or blue, based on are the rich getting richer? Are they investing and just getting more and more money? I mean, this is something we have to ask, right? Can, can, can I just be real in church today? It was, it was said that after President-elect Donald Trump won, that Elon Musk, who had invested $150 million in his campaign, that his net worth increased by $12 billion the next day. Can I ask a question? Was that a good investment? Hello? Was it a good investment? Absolutely it was a good investment. If you're wanting to make money, it was a good investment. Right? Would we tell somebody they're, 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 they're not being smart, they're not being fiscally responsible, if they're looking at the winds and they're, and they're seeing how, how, they can, how they can increase their wealth? Jesus uses a parable that seems to deal more with Bank of America and Chase than it does with spirituality. And this is what he likens to the end times. And believe it or not, going through what we've been going through this last week, there's a lot of people wondering if we're in the end times. And this parable is perfect for us. He rewards those who are aggressive. He rewards those who are willing to take the risk. But if you don't take risk, you're not going to get those kind of gains. Now, the servant who is considered lazy and wicked, he didn't lose money, right? He didn't lose money. The master's upset that he didn't gain him more. Now, I'm sorry. Are you going to be that angry if you have 12 billion that you didn't make more interest? Are you really going to be that upset with me and call me wicked? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not liking the way that God looks in this parable. That servant says, you're a hard master. You reap where you have not sown. You harvest where you have not farmed. In other words, if someone reaps where they have not sown, what would we call that person? What would we call that person? A thief. This man is the rich getting richer and stealing from the poor. And you want to commit, I'd be scared of him too. So he's a hard master. He's a thief. He's picking on the little guy here. And Jesus, you want to use this example for what the end times will be like? Jesus, come on. You can do better than that. Did you know what we were going to be going through in 2024? Didn't you know this was going to be my series before I knew anything? About any election? Let's dig deeper. Question, is the master a wicked man? Is he a hard man? Is he tough? Let's answer that question. Based on the story that we have, is he a tough master? He just gave $5 million to a servant without any instruction that's called a gift. Five million. Did tell him what to do with it. No instructions. Here's five million. And with another, another servant, he gave two million. Does that sound like a hard master? When was the last time your boss gave you $10 million? When was the last time your boss, independent of your work ethic, 
decided to give you an extra $100,000 and said, here. And you said, is this a Christmas bonus? No. I'm just going away for a long time. Here's some money. Here's the, the company's credit card. Anybody? Anybody ever experienced that before? And if your boss gave you that kind of money, would you go back home and say, ooh, my boss is evil. He set me up. My boss is evil. She is setting me up for failure. Is that what you would say? You would go home and say, oh, family, God is good. Look at what we were given. And because it's not your money, watch this, because it's not your money, you get to be more aggressive with it. Because it's, you know that your boss, who is a billionaire, is willing to take big risks because he has big resources, right? And so you get to go into the lab and go, hmm, I wonder if I can invest in this Belize ministry and helping kids to know how to read. I wonder if I could, I could, I could use this money to help build an infrastructure in, in some neighborhoods that, that need better schooling. I, I, I wonder if I could put my money to work in a way that I can be a greater blessing down the road. I would say based on the parable, he's not a hard master, he's a generous master. And when he comes back and sees that they have doubled it, he doesn't say, let me line more of my pockets. He says, I'm going to give you what? I'm going to give you more. Based on the parable, is that a hard master? Does it sound like a master who steals? Sounds like a master who is giving and generous. So we have to look at the lazy, wicked servant and say, although he saw his master in that way, that was an incorrect assessment. Do you know how many people live in church, in Christianity, with an incorrect perspective of who the master is? And they make decisions based on an, uh, 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 an erroneous view of God? Oh, he's hard. Ooh, he's hard. Ooh, when, you, when we get to the end, ooh, if you haven't been living right, ooh, you're going to get it. He's a tough master. And he's, and he's judging. You know, many of us see God in this way. And that dysfunctional view of how we see God informs how we live. Case in point, Adam and Eve take the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 3. And as soon as they hear God coming in the garden, what do they do? What does the Bible say they do? They run and they hide. Why would they do that? Have they seen God ever lose his temper? Anybody? Had he ever lost his temper like on a cow that didn't give good milk? Did he ever get upset with a giraffe that was kind of poking his nose in, in, in someone else's business? Did he ever tell Adam and Eve, if you do this, I'm telling you, I am going, I'm going to wring your little neck. They ran from something they had never seen before. They had never seen God stomp and go fee, fa, fo, fum. In fact, the Bible says he was walking in the cool of the day. Why were they running? And when God saw them, did he give them the right hand of fellowship across the face? Not at all. He warned them that what would happen under the government of Satan, that's what he warned them. He told them, he prophesied of what life was going to be like, not because God was going to make it that way, but that's because sin makes it that way. You guys understand that? We live in the world in which we live in today because of sin and brokenness. That is why when people talk about, don't worry, God is in control, he, he, everything is happening according to his plan. No, we vote. We make choices. It wouldn't have mattered if it was this president or that president. God did not cast a vote. Amen? I think I need to say that again. God did not cast a vote. That is why we have to be careful what we say. Because there are people that say, no, no, he's setting up governments, he's tearing them down, he's in control. God was not in control of Hitler. Hello? He was not in control of Hitler. He was not responsible for Hitler's actions. In fact, 
If Hitler was following the teachings of Jesus, he would have never done what he did. I understand the language of the Bible. I understand the language of the Bible. I get it. I get it. But we make our choices. We set up our kings according to Scripture. According to Scripture, and I know a number of you can help me out with this. According to Scripture, it was God who said, you should not have a king. That's what my word says. That's what my word says. You should not have a king. Because who was, who, who was their king? God was their king. What did the people cry out for? For a king. Was that God's vote? It was never God's vote, but he gave in to mankind's will in that situation. And this is why we need to be very careful about how we mix God with politics. Can I say that again? Do I need to say that again? We need to be careful how we mix God with politics. Because if God were actually in our Congress, actually in our boardrooms, actually in our homes, actually in our hearts, there's a lot of choices we would make different. I'm not sure if he would put that much money in the military. That's just me. He got upset when David started counting his fighting men, didn't he? He said, come on, man, I'm your protector. You don't need to count how many soldiers you have. What would this country look like if we truly put all of our faith in God Almighty? Where would our money go? Oh. I wonder if we would have one hungry person on this planet. I wonder if we would have one homeless person, unhoused person on this planet. We need to be careful how we mix God with politics. Vote to your conscience. Be happy if your candidate win. But at the end of the day, God's kingdom is different than the U.S. government. Sorry. I know. And for those of us who are Adventists, ooh, we know how we characterize the U.S. later on in prophecy. Be careful. My point is simply this. When we're looking at this parable, the master is generous. The master is good. The master is gracious. The master is kind. He is giving. And he's willing to let what we would call the small people have an opportunity to get a leg up. I know most people would never trust this much wealth with their servant, but I'm entrusting you with that. How many are you happy that God entrusts his spirit with us lowly folk? How many of you are happy that God entrusts his talents and his gifts with us, with us sinners, with those, with, with, with those of us who have issues with bitterness, those of us who have issue with racism, those of us who have issue with our ego? God entrusts his love, his spirit, his gifts with those that are undeserving. And the Bible says that you're a difficult man. It's the reason why I was afraid. The real reason why, the real reason why the man doesn't do anything is because God called him lazy. Now, why are we lazy, church? Why, are, why is it so difficult to get deacons to actually show up on a Sabbath? Why is it so difficult for us to get help in our Sabbath school classrooms with our young kids. What is so difficult about getting us to work more in the community? See, listen, as soon as these restrooms are completed, we're going to be doing some serious evangelism around here. I just had to wait until our stuff looked right. Because I ain't inviting people to the church when our stuff looks like Arco gas station. <laughs> but it's about to look good, right? It's about to, it's about to look all right. So, so once that happens, we're opening up these doors. But but why is it so difficult? God is wanting to entrust us with these talents. He wants to trust us with his resources. And we have ability. And we choose to be lazy. And I'm going to tell you why. The number one reason. The number one reason. There's several reasons, but because of time, just one reason. It's the main reason. It's the reason in this text. Fear. We are too afraid to fail. We're too afraid to get it wrong. And so we do nothing at all. 
We're afraid we won't sound right if we were to pray up front. We're afraid that eh, eh, we, we, we won't do well with the ministry if we were in charge of it. We're afraid that there, there's too many high expectations and, and we don't want to let anybody down. We're afraid of being judged, so we just kind of recoil and stay in our safe little cocoon. And at the end of the day, say, hey, at least I didn't cost you any points. But you also didn't score any points. Do I need to say that again? That's a sports reference for you. Sorry about those of you who didn't get it. I've changed from the money market to sports. You didn't cost any points, but you didn't score any as well. I'm coaching the middle school football team. And sorry, Dr. Schubert, I'm, we're, we're working on competition. We're working on competition. Those kids, we're, we're building up their character. We do really good with other teams. And we're very kind and we smile and we love on them, right? So I'm helping out. I'm helping out with the, the team. And there's a couple of athletic players in the team that don't have football IQ. They just haven't played before, which is fine. I get to teach. And so one of my players who plays safety on defense, that means he's the one that stays all the way in the back and makes sure that no one gets past him. I've been having to work with him on how to have football instincts. I said, when the ball's in the air, he said, yes, coach, it's your ball. It's my ball. When it's in the air, I want you to play like you're the wide receiver, and I want you to get that ball. Okay. So I've worked on it. And the other game which we won, that's not important. <laughs> the ball was in the air, and he has listened to all my coaching. And he took off running, and he jumped really high to intercept the ball, and he didn't quite make it. Ball went right over his fingertips into the receiver's hand, who caught it and ran for a touchdown. The results weren't what we wanted, but you know what I saw? I saw the effort that I wanted, and I went up to him. I said, oh, good instincts, way to attack the ball. You did a great job. You just missed it by a little bit, but don't doubt yourself. I'm glad that you did not wait for him to catch it. You went for the ball. He did the right thing, and this is what God is wanting. The issue was never how much money they made. It's that they did sit and do nothing at all. They weren't lazy. They didn't allow their fear to determine how much they would give to the Lord. And what's interesting in this parable, clearly it's not about money. The parable, yes, is using a money illustration, but it's really not about money. What does God give us? What is he giving us in abundance? What is God rich with that he gives us in abundance that we can give to everybody and we can multiply it? We can invest it and we'll always get returns. What is that? What do you think that is? What do you think that is? Oh, I'm hearing it. Say it louder. What do you think that is? Love. Love. It's the one thing he gives us, and he's never going to run out of it, that you can invest in fully, and you're always going to get a return. And even if you don't think that one person comes back and you wanted, you wanted things to be reconciled and you wanted them to be back in the fold again and they didn't do it, your effort... Going for it all is what counts. And may God find his church fully sold out, fully invested, at the end of time, loving people no matter how they vote, no matter who they side with, no matter how much they have or don't have, that, that we are as a church, we are sold out because you know what? Regardless of whatever our country decides on any of the issues, our mission, our mandate has not changed. Love one another. Love one another. And it gets better than that. Not just love as you want to be loved. He says, love as I have loved and that when you don't do that, you bankrupt yourself. That's why the, the parable of the, 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 the unforgiving servant, remember, he owed millions, owed millions. He could never pay it back. And what did his master do in that, in that scenario? What did his master do? He forgave him. In that scenario, was the master generous? Was the master gracious? Was the master merciful? So he's forgiven a debt he could never repay. He walks outside and sees somebody who owes him $5. And what did he do? Started beating him up. Let me ask you this question. 
in that parable, did the servant who had been forgiven millions really believe he was forgiven? Did he really believe he was loved? He didn't. There's no way you can act like that if you know you've been forgiven great. Right? He, did it. he was still acting like he was indebted. I got to get all my folk that owe me so I can hurry up and pay him back. And this is what God has never wanted from his people. He wants us to see him for who he is. Just like in the first parable, do you know the bridegroom? In this parable, do you really know the master? Because if you know the master, as he has been generous with you, you will be generous with others. As he has been gracious towards you, you will be what? Gracious towards others. As he has blessed you and entrusted you with much, you will find yourself doing the same thing. And if you're not doing the same thing, it's because you really don't trust the master. You really don't see him for who he is. So I want us, church family, I want us to go for it. I want us to invest. I know you're telling me, I don't have a lot to invest in the market. Whatever you have, invest it. Amen? Whatever you have to give, give. When Christ comes again, he's looking for a people that do not hold back when it comes to love. They give lavishly. Some might say it's reckless. Calvary may look reckless to some. But when you know the master, when you know the master, you understand why he loves the way he does. And people will understand why you love the way you love. Our country is going to be okay. It would have been okay if Vice President Kamala was elected. It'll be okay under Donald J. Trump. It would be okay even if we didn't have a president. Our mission has not changed. Love one another as I have loved you. So we get to love everybody. Independents, libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, people who go to Disneyland and people who go to Magic Mountain. It will not change. Catholic, Adventist, atheist, agnostic, our mission has not changed. God has given you much. What are you going to do? Bury it? You're going to be sad? You didn't get your way? Get over it. We still have a mission. Let's love and then join our master in his happiness. Can we do that? Let's love some more. Oh, but it's hard, pastor. Oh, but it's so much fun when it's more difficult. I like it when it's more difficult. I like the challenge. Let's love more. When people come into our church, they'll say, oh, there's something different about this church. There's something, doesn't matter if there's a different generation, doesn't matter what ethnicity, what culture, doesn't matter what political party, doesn't matter. When you come to this church, you're loved, you're cared for. It's different. We're under the politics of heaven. We're under the politics of the kingdom of God. And this is what the end time will look like. And this gospel of this kingdom will go out as a testimony into all the world, and then the end shall come. Invest, invest, invest. For there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear will not keep us lazy. We're in love with the master. We're going to give. Church family, do you want to do that? If that's what you want to do, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as the praise team comes up. I'm asking you to stand to your feet if that's what you want to do. You just want to love. You want to invest. You want to pour in. Oh, but pastor, I might get hurt if I do that. If I give the relationship another chance, I might get hurt. Yes. But if you don't try, you'll never get the return. You'll never get the harvest. So let's try it out. What do we have to lose? It's not even our money. <laughs> we love because he first loved us. We're working with his love. Father God, you see those who are standing right now. This is what they're choosing. This is their vote for you and for your kingdom. 
for your presidency. We cast our vote for you that we may love more like you, Jesus. You've entrusted us with little. We will be faithful with that little. You've trusted some of us with much, and we will be faithful with much. And the more that we are faithful, the more that you give, the more we love, the more you love. We can't wait to see how this community is transformed so that when you come back, it's doubled, it's tripled, it's quadrupled. It's a number that no man can count because we're first in love with you and we channel that love to everyone else. Thank you so much, Jesus, in your name. Amen.